Hello and welcome. I'm really happy that you're all with me today, even if it's remotely. Um, before I dive in today, I'm just briefly going to introduce myself so you know who I am, and then we're going to dive right into and quite deep into Python's internals. So my name is Sebastian. I live in the Netherlands near a city called Die Haag, and I work for Ordina. Or more specifically, I work for a practice within Ordina called the Ordina Pythoneers. And this is basically a unit that's specifically focused on Python development. I'm also one of Ordina's codesmiths, which just means that I get some time for innovation, uh, like talking at conferences, but also just enjoying all the new technologies and sharing them with my colleagues. Uh, in my spare time, I'm a volunteer for EuroPython. We had a very successful conference uh, in July, and uh, we're now preparing for next year. And finally, I'm one of the 30 founders of Python Discord, which is a large online uh, Python community. You should definitely check it out if you haven't heard of, heard of it already. So today, we're really going to make a journey, and it's quite a long journey. We're going to go from source code all the way to execution on the other end. I'm not just going to give you a lecture on those topics, but instead I will do that by implementing a new operator, an operator that's not yet in Python. More about that operator later. One thing to note though, and this is a serious disclaimer for this talk, uh, I do have a lot of time constraints, so there, there will be blatant emissions, there will be gross oversimplifications, I will take shortcuts, and whatever code I produce while it's working, it's purely educational, so don't use it in production. If you do want to dive into CPython even more deeply, uh, definitely check out these resources. There's the Python Developer's Guide on devguide.python.org, and there's the excellent CPython Internals book by Anthony Scholl. Definitely check that one out as well. Just go through it from start to finish, and you'll see something really amazing. Anyway, so today, what are we going to do? Well, first, we're going to start with source code. And uh, in part one, we're going to parse that source code and produce something that is a little bit easier for computers to work with. And this is called an abstract syntax tree. We'll see what it is later, but that's, that is the goal of part one, parsing the source code and ending up with something called an abstract syntax tree. Then in part three, uh, part two, there's no part three. <laughs> then in part two, we're going to take that abstract syntax tree. We're going to compile it into bytecode. We're going to feed it to the evaluation loop, and then hopefully something happens, some magic happens. The computer will do something. And with a bit of luck, it's actually the thing you intended. For me, that's not always the case. Um, but that's basically what we're going to see today. We're going to, all, to see all the moving parts that are needed to get from source code to execution. Um, there's a lot of information today, um, so if you want to check out the slides afterwards, they're on my GitHub page, you can find them there. The source code is also there, including the new operator, so you can use it. Um, so definitely check that out. So, right, we're going to implement a new operator. But what kind of operator are we going to implement? Well, we're going to, op uh, we're going to implement a pipe operator. And pipe operators, they work with simple functions. They take one argument and they return one value. So if you look at this double function over here, it takes one argument, a number, and it just doubles the number and it returns that. Now, normally you'd call that function double and then just pass in the one, but the pipe operator allows us to call that function in a slightly different way. And in this way, we just start with the argument, then we use the pipe operator, and then we pipe that argument into the function. So this little expression over here would be equivalent to calling the function with one. And as you can see, we just get a two as a result. Well, on its own, this isn't really interesting, but one thing that you can do with these kinds of operators is that you can build pipelines. So here I start with a one again, and then I feed it into a double, and whatever comes out of that double will be fed into another double call. So now we get four because we've doubled the one two times. And obviously now you can make um, um, execution pipelines or processing pipelines where you start with a value and then end up with the result on the other end. Well, do note, this operator is not a part of Python. We're going to implement it here uh, and it probably will never be a part of Python. It has been proposed before, 
uh, but it has been rejected for good reasons. Do read those PEPs and uh, the responses to it if you, uh, if you like. Uh, and also note, as I mentioned before, the implementation that we're going to make is purely educational. We're going to take some shortcuts. We're going to do some things in a slightly different way because they have more educational value. Uh, but do try, just download the source code. It's available, play around with it, make it better, but don't use it in production. That's really important. Well, anyway, let's start implementing it. So in part one, uh, we're going to start with the raw source code. And what we want to do is we want to end up with a representation like you have on the left here, an abstract syntax tree, which is just a different way of representing your source code. In this case, if you'd have a module, a Python file with just one expression in it, the expression that you see on the right, um, or on the left, sorry, um, this would be kind of what you what you get out of the, uh, uh, th this is kind of the abstract syntax tree that you would get for that module. So there's a module on the top, that's the big node that contains everything. There's a single expression in it. It's a binary operation, a bin up expression, which means that you have an operator and then two values, one on the left and one on the right. That makes it a binary operator. So beneath that bin up node, you have the constant, the 10 in this case, you have the operator, call pipe, and then you have the name and the load. So what we're going to do next is we're going to implement the necessary changes in CPython for it to be able to parse that expression, parse that and produce that uh, abstract syntax tree for us. So let's first zoom in on the source code itself. So for us humans, we are really good at reading. We are really good at recognizing patterns, uh, uh, grouping stuff together. Um, so for us, it's immediately obvious that there's a 10 there. There's some kind of weird operator. Even if we don't recognize it in Python, we can recognize it as an operator. And then there's a name double. But for Python, when it starts out, this is just a long sequence of characters. There are 12 characters there, including spaces. I've left out the uh, uh, line endings here. So Python still has to make sense of those 12 individual characters. And it does that in a process called tokenization. And it has a tokenizer. It will take those characters and it will produce a sequence of tokens. Uh, the, the smallest uh, irreducible parts that would lose its meaning if you were, if you were to split them up any further. So here we have a number token, which is just a 10. If you remove any of the digits, it would become a different number. Here we have a name token. That's not an issue for Python as well. If you would remove any of the characters, you would get a different name. So this really is a single name token. But the problematic part here is that we have an unknown token in the middle. There's no such token in Python yet. The tokenizer doesn't know that token. And if you're really uh, deep into Python, you'd notice that there are actually two different tokens here, a vertical bar and a greater token. You really want to combine the two in one single token. So how are we going to do that? Is that difficult? Do we have to write a lot of code? The answer is no. And this is a theme that we'll see a lot today. A lot of Python is just defined in configuration files. And then there are some smart algorithms that will then translate the configuration file into real code. So this is it. This is a part of that configuration file. It's in grammar slash tokens. And this is just a mapping of, of token names on one side to the character sequence on the other side. So as you can see here, we have a few different tokens. The only thing that we have to do is we have to add our own token. Uh, I've named it the VBAR grader because there is no implementation here yet, no semantics, no meaning. This is just describing the token itself. So we have a vertical bar and we have a grader sign after it. So this is the VBAR grader token. Uh, and now after we've defined this, we can actually regenerate the entire tokenizer that's contained in Python by running this command. And after running this command, the tokenizer will now be able to recognize the token and uh, translate it to one token. And yeah, and as I mentioned before, this is a theme that you'll see a lot. You'll make some changes. You're going to run some commands. I'm not going to dive into those commands because you can look them up after my talk. This is what we're going to see. Make changes, run something. Well, after we have this token, um, we still have to give it a role in Python's grammar because now Python can recognize the token, but it doesn't know in which context, in which syntax it's valid. So we still have to translate, we still have to add a rule to Python's grammar. 
So that's going to be the next thing that we're going to do. Now that we've modified the, token uh, the tokenizer, we're going to change Python's grammar and then ensure that the parser that's in Python can actually use that grammar to produce something. Um, and then finally, the parser, uh, Python's parser that uses the grammar will produce that abstract syntax tree for us. So if you've ever worked with Python in the past, you might remember there being something called a concrete syntax tree. Uh, this is no longer the case. Since Python 3.9 with the new pack parser, we're going to make changes to the parser and it will directly produce our abstract syntax tree. So let's do that. Let's make changes to Python's grammar. In order to do that, I'm briefly going to explain Python's grammar to you, par uh, Python's parsing expression grammar, the pack grammar that the pack parser uses. Um, but I'm not going to explain all of it because it's quite complex. What I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly introduce it to you and only introduce the parts that we actually need. So let's do that. So let's imagine that we have a very, very, very simple language. It only has two expressions. There are some statement rules and, and file rules that we're not going to bother with, but it only has two expressions somewhere within the language. And these are the two. It has a sum expression, which is basically just add something to something else. And then we have numbers, an atom, uh, a single number. So there are no strings, there are no uh, uh, other lists, arrays, that kind of thing. We only have these two expressions. Now, one important thing to note here is that these rules are uh, um, connected. So as you can look at the sum rule here, it actually references the atom rule, the number on its own. And this is how the grammar works. This is how all the grammar rules eventually get checked because they are contained within a higher order grammar rule. So if we start at the sum uh, 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 rule here, we will only ever consider the atom rule because it's part of the sum rule. Now, the sum rule has two alternatives. It will either match an, 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 an atom plus another atom, or it will just match an atom on its own. So if we look at this single number here, a single number on, uh, on, it, uh, on its own, when we apply these rules, we'll just start with the sum rule. And the sum rule We'll first try its first, first alternative, atom plus atom. Well, we don't have a plus character here, so that rule fails. Then we move on to the second alternative, uh, um, which is just an atom on its own. And an atom is just a number. So we can parse this number here with this grammar rule. It is just a number on its own. It's fairly obvious to see that this expression, one plus two, can also be parsed by our grammar rule because we have atom plus atom as the first alternative in our sum rule. So we have no issue in parsing this expression. So here we have a symbol sum. But now what about this expression? One plus two plus three. Can we match that one? Well, this one is a little bit more problematic. So if we, um, if we look at how the, the, the parser works, it will first try to match that one plus two. And it has a rule for that. It has an atom plus an atom. So once we've parsed this part, we've consumed these tokens. And what we're left with is plus three. Can we actually match plus three here? Well, there's no grammar rule that starts with a plus. So the second part of this expression, the plus three, cannot be parsed by our grammar rules. And this is obviously a problem because we want to be able to one to use two pluses, maybe three pluses, four pluses. Um, so what are we going to do about it? Are we going to add a, a rule for two pluses and a rule for three pluses? What about an arbitrary amount of pluses? Do we need an infinite number of some alternatives? Luckily, we don't. What we can do is we can use a little bit of recursion. So we can change the first alternative of the sum rule. And we can replace the first atom uh, by sum itself. And remember... Since a sum can just be an atom on its own, this rule can still be atom plus atom, but it can also be atom plus atom plus atom, because we can now embed one sum expression into another sum expression using this recursion. And obviously just, this just goes on and on and on. So now suddenly by changing one thing, we can match an arbitrary number of pluses in an expression. And this is really handy for our pipe operator as well. Because if you think about it, we want to be able to build um, 
processing pipelines. So we want to be able to start with a value and then chain all those different uh, operators after each other, like in this example. So what we're going to do, is we're going to just write such a recursive grammar rule for our new operator as well. So this is the actual grammar file of Python. There are some extra bits in here that we'll see later. But what we're going to do is I'm going to add a new rule between the shift expression for bit shifting and the sum rule for doing plus and minus. So what are we going to do? Just going to add a new rule called pipe. And here in this part, we'll see our, our recursive uh, rule. This makes an arbitrary pipeline of uh, uh, operators possible. There's just one problem yet, and that is that this pipe rule is not considered by any of the higher order rules. It will never be considered. There's no other grammar rule pointing to this rule as an alternative. So what are we going to do? Well, we can just look at the shift expression and see that it just references the sum expression. So what are we to do? Well, just change it. We're going to make the shift expression point to our pipe rule and our pipe rule will point to our uh, sum rule. And now we have cascading grammar rules again that just flow neatly down the chain. And in this case, um, we now have our recursive relationship. So this means that we can now parse this expression. Now we're done, right? Well, not quite. Because the next thing that we have to do is we have to translate the parsed expression into such an abstract syntax tree node. And with the new pack parser, we can actually do that from within the parser. And the way in which we do that is by using something called a grammar action. And this is one of the extra bits that we saw earlier. This here, this is a grammar action. And it's just a piece of embedded C code in this case between curly braces. So this expression just calls a function in C that will produce a, bin, a bin up AST node. So what kind of information does that function need? Well, it needs to have uh, uh, the left-hand side of the uh, operator, obviously it has to have the right-hand side and it has to know of the operator itself. So in order to pass in that information within the grammar, you can actually assign name, names to the parts that you're matching. So as you can see here, we've assigned an, uh, uh, the name A to the left-hand side of the plus and we've assigned the name B to the right hand side of the plus and we pass those into the C function that we're calling. We also know that this is an add because this is the, the, the rule with plus in it. So we just pass in the operator uh, in the middle and we pass in some extra bits that have to do with line number, column number, very handy for the, for the parser and for exceptions and things like that. But we're not going to worry about that today ourselves. So what do we have to do with our rule? Well, we have to introduce such a grammar action. And since we also have a binary operator, we can just basically copy paste this part up. The only thing that we really have to change is that instead of an add operator in the middle, we now use a call pipe operator in the middle. Now, each node in an AST is just a class. So bin up is a class, constant is a class, name is a class, but now we also need a class for call pipe because that one doesn't exist yet. We can use the name here, but if the class doesn't exist, we cannot actually uh, uh, use that name. So we have to make sure that the call pipe class exists for the AST before we can actually run this grammar. And that's the next thing that we're going to do. Now, luckily we don't have to code a lot. Because just like with the grammar and with the tokens, the AST and all the classes that we need for the AST, they are just defined in another configuration file. And then we can create all the classes necessary just by running a generator. And how do we do that? Well, we're just op you just open the file parser slash python.asdl, which stands for abstract syntax definition language. And here you just see all the nodes and all the kind of types that, that you need are just listed here. And then we can automatically generate whatever we need from this. So as you can see here, we have an operator listing. Here is our add operator, which is just mentioned here. And then magic takes care of the rest. So what if we want to have a call pipe node for operator? Well, we basically just add another option to the end, call it call pipe. Then we regenerate the AST, the abstract syntax tree, uh, a data uh, a logic that we need 
and boom, we have a class for call pipe. And this is all that we have to change. So now that we have support in the AST, we have a call pipe class and we have our grammar rule. We can now finally regenerate the entire parser um, so that it includes our new grammar rule. And that's it, it works. And we can actually test that out. We can just import AST, let the AST parse the expression, and we'll see a bin up node, we see a call pipe node, that's the one we just added, and everything just works for us. Cool. So what we can now do is we can take uh, your source code and we can produce an AST node on the other hand, the tree-like structure of our operation. But, we, but what we can't do yet is we cannot actually execute this code. There's no execution uh, linked to this AST node. So how are we going to do that? Well, now in part two, we're going to compile that AST node um, into something called bytecode, which is just a long sequence of instructions that we can actually work with. Uh, and then we have an evaluation loop and that will actually evaluate and execute all that bytecode that we have. Now in bytecode, we have a number of operation codes or opcode. So basically for each action that Python needs to do, add something, subtract something, call this function, uh, assign something to this name or load this name, there's a specific operation code or opcode. Now for our new operator or our call pipe action, we also need such an opcode. We could have, I could have reused the, the opcode for calling functions, but that's no fun. I want to show you how to implement a new opcode. So we need to add support for call pipe in the bytecode. And once again, this isn't actually that difficult. There's just a Python file. The only Python file that we'll see during this talk is called lib slash opcode.py. And it just defines all the opcodes that we have in Python. So here we have pop accept and it's assigned to the number or to the byte 89. So now our opcode, it doesn't have an additional argument. So it has to uh, have, an, have an, a number below the number in half argument. So I'm just going to insert it here, give it the number 90, then increase all the numbers after it by one, which is a bit of a boring task, but it's something that we have to do. After we've defined this, we can again run another generator. It will regenerate all the opcodes. And now we have an opcode for our binary pipe call. So now we have a potential instruction that we can write to the bytecode. We just haven't told the compiler yet when it should write that uh, instruction. And we also haven't told the evaluation loop what it should do when it sees that instruction. But we do have the opcode itself at this point. So now let's look at the compiler. And the compiler is a C file. It's in python slash compile.c. And what basically happens is that the compiler will uh, travel along the AST. It will travel along all the nodes in the AST. And whenever it visits a specific node, it will call a function to handle that. So deep inside the compiler, there's a, uh, there's a function called compiler visit expr1, expression one. And this, uh, this function will eventually get called when in the AST we see an expression node. And within this function, there's just a big switch case statement that takes care of actually writing the, the relevant opcodes. So here you can see we switch, we switch on the expression kind. Now for us, we have a binary op expression, so a bin op kind. So this case here is the one that's relevant for us. The compiler will first write all the expressions to get the left-hand side value. Uh, this is important. Then it will write all the instructions. It will visit the right-hand side to write all the instructions to get the right-hand side value to evaluate that one. Because only once we have both values, can we actually combine them in the operator. So we first do left, then we do right. That's important for later on. And then we will write the right opcode for this specific binary operation. And we know which opcode to write by calling this helper function bin op which is just another switch case statement. And it has a case for each AST operator class like add here, and it just returns the opcode that belongs to that uh, operation. So for us, we just add a case call pipe and we return our new binary pipe call operation code. And now we're nearly done with the compiler. The only thing that, that's left is we have to specify the stack effect 
This is for something called the value stack, which we'll see a little bit later. And in this case, whenever we perform a binary pipe call, there will be one value less on the value stack than there was before. And we'll see why in just a short bit. So for our case, we need to return minus one as well. And this is it. This is all that we need for the compiler. The compiler now knows when to write our uh, special opcode into the bytecode. So we can now produce the bytecode for our operation. The only thing that we cannot do yet is actually execute that operation. So we now still have to turn that intermediate language, that bytecode, that opcode into uh, magic. It's something that actually happens. And that's, that's something that will happen in the evaluation loop. So the evaluation loop, just like the name says, is just one big loop that goes round and round and round. And it will iterate over all the instructions in the bytecode, over each individual bytecode that's, that's in the bytecode file. Um, and within that huge loop, there's just one big switch case statement. And it has a case for each operation that it needs to be able to perform. And then there's the code that actually handles the operation. So for instance, if you do A minus B, something minus something else, there's a binary subtract, and this is the target for binary subtract. So we can notice that we have the target binary subtract, and then there's some logic to actually perform the subtraction. There's one small issue here, uh, because we don't, have to we don't actually have the values yet that we want to subtract from each other. So how do we get those? Well, and that's where this part comes in. We have to get the right-hand side of the operator and the left-hand side. And for this, we need the value stack. Because remember, earlier, when we have an expression, a binary expression, we notice that we will first write the, the operations to evaluate the left-hand side. And once we've done that, and Python has that value, it will put it on to something called the value stack to, to keep track of the value for later on. So now we have a four in the value stack, then we evaluate the right-hand side, and the value of that will be put on top of the value stack above the four. So after evaluating both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we will have a value stack that has a three on top and a four just below that. And this is where these pops and tops come in. Pop will just get the three from the value stack and now write points to three in memory. Top. Uh, is slightly similar, but it will leave the value on the, on the value stack, but left will still point to the four in memory. So now we have the two values and we can actually call the function, a special C API function called pi number subtract to subtract three from four, which obviously it will get as a result. So result points to one at this point. Then we're done with the right hand side and the left hand side. So we decrease the reference counts um, and finally, we have to do something with the result. So where do we put it? We put it on the value stack. But instead of putting it on top of the four, we're actually going to replace the four. And this is where the minus one from earlier came from. We started with two values on the value stack and after performing the operation, we're left with one. So that's the stack effect of minus one. After that, there's some error handling and finally dispatch, which just means, hey, evaluation loop, go on to the next uh, bit. So what do we have to change for our op operation? Well, it's very similar. We just copy paste the code. We change the target. And instead of subtracting the numbers from each other, we're going to call a function with one argument. And remember, the function was on the right-hand side and the number on the left-hand side. And the rest is just the same. We're going to decrease the reference counts. We're going to put the result back on the value stack and then dispatch. So this is basically all that we need for the magic. And that's it. The evaluation loop now has support for our operation. So now we can go from the AST to magic and in turn from source code all the way to execution. The only thing left to do, compile, 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 start Python, and you can actually see that it works. Well, summing up, we've seen a lot of Python, C Python internals. Do check out uh, the GitHub repository for if you want to look back. And if you get weird errors, try a clean all or look into the magic number. And that's we, all we have time for today. Uh, I, I'd like to thank you for coming to my talk. And uh, here's some information on how to contact me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye.